coming to you from Strings and Things Studio in Ventura, California. I'm Katie. I'm Anne. And I'm Karen. And this is the Strings Unraveled Book Club. Welcome, everybody, to the book club this month. It is February, um, and it was my pick. So this month, we are reading a collection of short stories. <clears throat> this month, we're reading a collection of short stories by a local author, uh, Dallas Woodburn. The book we read is called How to Make Paper When the World is Ending. Um, I found out about this book when I picked up an issue of The Breeze and I was flipping through it and um, I have just a little excerpt from The Breeze to give us a little uh, backstory. Um, So this is from the Ventura County Breeze. It says, Award-winning author and Ventura native Dallas Woodburn's new short story collection, How to Make Paper When the World is Ending, um, releases on June 28th. This was two years ago, I think. Or last year. Um, and locals might find some something familiar about the settings of many of these stories. The pier, the beach, the boardwalk. And yes, many of the stories take place in a fictionalized Ventura. Um, Woodburn notes. This is not the first time her hometown has made it into her fiction. Woodburn's short story collection, Woman Running Late in a Dress, also featured familiar settings such as the beach, lemon orchards, and downtown Main Street. As readers will recognize Ventura in her latest novel, Thanks Carissa for Ruining My Life. It was def- She says, I was definitely picturing Ventura in my mind as I wrote. The high school was Ventura High. The bowling alley was Buena Lanes. Their favorite restaurant is based on Snapper Jacks. <laughs> There's just little clues throughout the book. Mm-hmm. She said, Woodburn, uh, Woodburn says that the setting for her fiction is not something she logically plans out, but rather rises up organically through the creative process. I wrote the first draft of my novel and many of these stories when I was a grad student at Purdue University in Indiana. I was homesick for Ventura and escaping into my fiction felt like visiting home. Um, she grew up in Ventura, graduated from Ventura High School, and has been part of the Ventura County literary community for more than two decades. Um, so that's what drew me in and add, made it uh, made me add this book to my list of uh, things that I wanted to read. Um, and you can pick up a copy from our favorite local bookstore, Timber. Or Tamber. Um, yeah, so this is a... I think this is our first short story collection for the podcast um it is a collection of 10 i think 10 short stories um and i have like tiny little synopses for each one so we can refresh our memory but um i guess we'll just start out with did you enjoy it i did yeah yeah i did i enjoyed it too it was a fast read um i mean each of the stories was definitely fast because some Mm -hmm. of them are like two pages some of them take up larger chunks of the of the book but yeah i thought it was i thought it was fun to read i thought she was a great author i'm excited to read um especially her newest one that she says is definitely inspired by ventura because not every one of these stories in this um collection are but some of them very directly are and mention places by name that you'll recognize which i thought was fun Mm -hmm. um yeah so of the 10 short stories the first one is i'm just going to go through them all and then we i have a couple questions we can um talk about <clears throat> first one is called story to tell around a campfire uh, about a couple named mark and hannah who go on a weekend trip together to his family's cabin and the premise of the story is are we telling a romantic story or are we telling a scary story um how does it end based on what kind of story we are reading or writing Um, The second is How to Make Paper When the World is Ending, uh, about a girl named Erin who works at a transfer station, and it's family day. What is a transfer station? I couldn't quite understand what that is. I think it's something to trash or recycling. It's where the trash trucks go before they get sorted to wherever they go next, I think. Oh, EJ Harrison. Or something. Yeah. Um, It's family day. She's teaching kids how to make paper. Um, The story takes place in the near future, I believe, where polar bears... Um, and penguins, I think, are extinct. Her family's home and parents... Um, her family's home was destroyed in a tsunami and her parents were killed um, in the tsunami that destroyed her small beachside hometown. Um, the third one is called Feeding Lucifer. 
about a girl named Madison who moves to Port Wainimi as a preteen at the brink of her, of her puberty. Um, she meets a girl who's a little bit older than her named Grace. Um, she thinks Grace is a little weird. Madison wants to make cool friends, so she kind of uh, brushes her off a little bit. Um, but she hangs out with her in the meantime while she's trying to meet new friends. Um, she meets her family's pets, a snake named Lucifer and a rat named Ezzy or Esmeralda. She agrees to pet sit for them when Grace's family is out of town. Um, she invited over some like cool boys to hang out and she gets her first kiss when the snake escapes and her uh, rat that she's pet sitting for dies. <laughs> um, she never tells Grace exactly what happened and then her Grace and her family eventually move away. Um, and it's revealed that her dad is a snake handling pastor, <laughs> which I saw coming and I was oh, like, yeah. when are we going to yeah. hear about this? Um, Goose Pimples is about a man who we just know as Coach Blake, um, who he sort of is reminiscing on a time when a young student of his named Bridget um, basically exposed herself to him and he refused her um, when he offered to give her a ride home. He was her soccer coach and biology teacher. Um, he then left the school and became a lab technician um, after the fact. Um, the next one is called How My Parents Fell in Love, which dis which uh, are different recounts of how the writer's parents met and fell in love, basically. Um, receiptless, a man named Jeremy goes to a store where he gave his last love, Samantha, his heart. He wants to return her heart since they broke up recently. Um, he returns it, but he doesn't exchange it. Because he isn't ready for that yet, he doesn't have a receipt because he didn't thought he would. He never thought he would need one. Um, the clerk assures him that she will call him if Samantha ever returns his heart. Uh, dog sitting is about a man named Phil who's dog sitting for his friend, staying in his apartment in Oxnard. Um, he meets a woman at the dog park um, and her dog, who she's also dog sitting for. Um, and then there's a secondary story about what he does for work. He works at an assisted living facility and he's worried about one of his residents who has stopped eating. Um, Frozen Windmills is about a woman named Sandra living in Indiana and dating a man named Kevin. They've known each other for a few weeks when she has to fly back home to attend a funeral of her first boyfriend, Stephen, who was paralyzed as a teenager. And she um, sort of blames herself for that. Um, how to make spinach artichoke lasagna three weeks after your best friend's funeral. The protagonist is learning how to cook a lasagna, um, and dealing with the grief of losing her best friend in a car accident three weeks prior. Um, her best friend lives in Paris and she was supposed to go visit her with her boyfriend, but she's debating whether or not she's going to be able to make that trip. Real love is about a divorced dad who joins a Beatles cover band during his midlife crisis. <laughs> The Man Who Lives in My Shower um, is about a woman named B who is moving to a new apartment and sees the ghost of her um, ex-fiance um, who killed himself. And she's struggling with uh, getting over that. Tarzan is about a teenager named Jeremy who's a high school boy who has stopped um, talking at home and his mother's worried about him. Um, and it's uh, about his parents who are separated. Um, Pieces is about a young woman who becomes obsessed with a sweepstakes contest. Think of like Monopoly when they play that at Vons and you get all the little pieces to bring home and put on your game board. Um, and in the wake of her roommate's sudden death, they started playing the game together and she's obsessed with trying to win the game. Sustenance is the story of a daughter and a mother through the lens of their relationship with food. And Dirt is the last one about an old man who, named William who falls and hurts his hip and waiting for someone to come by and help him. And he sort of recalls the story of his life. Um, and those are the very basic sort of synopses that I have for each one of these stories. So I would like to start with maybe which one was your favorite? I like them all. It's hard to choose a favorite. Yeah. Uh, the one I liked um, least is how to make paper. You're skipping world... forward to my next question. Oh, the I'm question sorry. is what's your favorite? No, I'll just come kidding. back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I love the first one a lot. Yeah. That sets a really good tone and it's inter it's a good thought experiment. It's a really good. I was glad that she started with that one because it really drew me in. That's the mm -hmm. story to tell around a campfire. I was going to say that's my first one. It exactly i was gripped i'm like okay 
this was the and I, the whole time I'm thinking this was the best first story mm -hmm. because it makes you want to keep reading everything else because it just grabs you from the very beginning. It's so smart. Like I've never read anything like that in the way that she frames it between like if you're writing this sort of story this happens if you're writing that sort of story this happens so you're getting two parallel stories happening at the exact same time i thought it was and so well done too. yeah <laughs> and it was I could, fascinating and i could see it from both points of view yeah and i love i love how the stories we um drifted apart and then there was and then they come back together to a portion that could fit either scenario yeah um I kind of wanted to hear more, and it left me wanting more of this, this story. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Oh, I need to. I want to know how does this couple's relationship? Yeah, what happens next that nobody knows? Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's a because it you don't know which kind of story it really mm -hmm. was. It was kind of spooky. Um, yeah, I just yeah. thought it was really smart um, because you're right. I want to know each one of these stories, and either one of them would have made a good story on their own. But I, I think I had a tie cool. for second. I have a tie for yeah. second also. And you, I, <laughs> I love receiptless. Hold I, on. Can I finish? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I was no, just no, wanted yeah, to say. Absolutely. Um, with the story to tell around the campfire, you can tell she's um, Dallas Woodburn, the author, is an author coach as well. So she helps people learn to write mm -hmm. stories. Yep. And that really came through in this. Yeah. I thought it was so smart. Yeah. yeah Sorry. Good workshop. No, no, no. Yeah. Your second favorite. Oh, I didn't say what my favorite was. Oh, yeah, what is your my favorite? I assumed it was that one. <laughs> I assumed it no, was the first one. But... I did really like that one. I think my favorite was Feeding Lucifer, though, ah. um, about the snake. I thought that one was exciting, and um, I was excited to get to where I knew it was going, which uh -huh. was like, when are we going to talk about the dad being a snake handling yeah. pastor? Because it's, yeah, you knew it was coming. Oh. He doesn't come out of his cage unless his dad is practicing Otherwise, he's locked away in his cage, and she's not sure if he's venomous or not. Yep. Yeah. And I like, know when the I practicing. Just, yeah. <laughs> Unless just, dad is practicing, I was like, practicing what with? Yeah, oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought maybe he's a magician or something. I wasn't as interested in the dad, but I thought it captured. So that that was one of the two that tied for me for second, mm -hmm. and because it captured all that awkwardness of the all being in a new place and having to make friends and always yeah. being outside of the group, and then you. You know, you have someone else who likes you and you, you like being liked, but at the same time, they're kind of too weird like you. And everyone, <laughs> and yeah, everyone knows that one weird homeschool kid, too, that uh, you just sort of end awkward, up being friends with. But yeah. yeah, they're definitely a little weird, a little awkward. See, I didn't think of the word homeschool. <laughs> I don't know if she was. I was just getting those vibes from the homeschool kids that I grew up with. <laughs> and being far enough away from it, I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that and receipt list. Yeah. That the fact that, well, sir, without a receipt, we really, we can give you credit, but we can't give it back until we get it back. Uh -huh. yeah. And I thought, well, that leaves hope that, that the person that he's upset with is not willing to, she didn't immediately give his heart back. I so also, I oh. like, and I just love that scenario of, well, I'm not really sure, but I'm in the passion of the moment. I just, I want to leave it on. I don't, I don't know if I want it back. Are you sure, sir? Because once you get it yeah you can't you can't get you can't you know try this one again and it also it starts out as such a normal like conversation between the clerk and him at the store mm -hmm. that you you don't know what it's about and then all yeah. of a sudden he's like it's a human heart and i was like what kind of story is this <laughs> and i was like oh i understand yeah. but for a second it was like she pulled out a human heart out of the bag i was like oh oh no my, my girlfriend's my ex-girlfriend's heart <laughs> what kind of story is this one yeah <laughs> where are we going my tie for uh second favorite is receiptless and the man who lives in my shower mm. yeah i mm. really like that i thought that was a very good imagery of of grief yeah a lot of these stories are a, i mean we'll get to uh, a question later on about sort of like the through line of them but a lot of them do deal with um grief and uh, a lot of them are very heartbreaking. <laughs> yep. There's a lot of sad stories. Yeah. Yeah. That one was definitely hard. Hard. One of the harder ones to read, but it was yep. very good. Um, so what's your least favorite one and why? Uh, the, t the titular story. Yeah. Be only because like 24, the show that wiped my hometown from uh -huh. the map in uh -huh. I think the first season, which is exploding <laughs> Valencia early on. Uh -huh. Um, like Ventura's wife from... <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to believe that that one was Ventura, but it did make me sad to I think of I kept picturing her sitting on, like, 
what is now like a cliff and it's Sarah yeah. Cross or whatever. I was just thinking it's like, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, that one was, that's exactly what I was picturing too. <laughs> um, I also have one thing that like took me out of the story, sort of like, um, like, um, you know, growing up in Southern California, you guys in Fillmore and mm-hmm. me in Santa Clarita, you see a lot of your hometown playing other places. Yeah. So um, my like love hate is um, Little Miss Sunshine. Yeah, because it's all all over Santa Clarita yeah. and it's all over here, yep. you know. Like if I want to tell somewhere where Crown Plaza is, I'm like, you know that movie where they're the driving outside? the opposite yeah. way on the on the on ramp that you can't go that oh, direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this took me out in um, oh, I think it's in dog sitting. Yeah, he um, says that he used to be a, a server at, at the, the Red Lobster, Lobster on in- Seaward. Uh-huh. I was like, there's no Red Lobster I on Seaward. Have asked. <laughs> Two people who lived here a long time. That. And you, you've been, you, I mean, is there a red lob? Was there ever a red lobster? No, on there wasn't. One, one person said yes and one person said no. No, I, okay, part of me thinks that the, I kind of remember that there was. There used to be three restaurants there was the Chinese one, mm-hmm. there was like an El Torito. No, yeah, yeah there was, was an, an El Torito. Torito because Acapulco, which was That's like, the other Acapulco one. is over, was over on by a government East center. Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. There but, was, and there's like Coco's or Caro's or one of those. Yeah. yeah. Well, that but that was not there. You're talking about like where Golden Golden China was. Where Golden China yeah. Was, yeah. was, there was. I thought there was a Red Lobster there. Okay. For a very well, that very would count short time. Maybe of. that's off a of seaward. seaward. That is off a of seaward. If, yeah. Yeah. If you yeah, know, you can write back and tell us. Because Coco's is Dallas, over. fact check this, time. Huh? <laughs> because I'm pretty sure Coco's is or was over by the grocery store in the and the. The I think donut Caro's. That that's Caro's. Caro's, but is but or now the donut Black Bear the donut shop that you could get fill, filled donut holes. It's still there. Yeah, it's still there. Yeah, and it's I, so good. It but so good. I can't eat them, so I don't care anymore. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> except to grieve that I can't eat them. I'll <laughs> eat one. It's like spilling a little out for your friend. I'll, yeah, I'll I eat an know. extra one the next time I have an opportunity. <laughs> Before, yeah, they are very good. because <laughs> like this one's for Karen, not the extra one. Because I want above anyway. the, just above the hill. Uh, off a of seaward is um, like a good Sam. My husband worked briefly for the Good Sam's Club oh, yeah. company that had that. And on their lunch, some or in the morning, someone would grab a couple dozen of those, and he'd say like they were so filled that it was one of those things where you had to be careful. You pop one in your mouth, and it was like it's oozing <laughs> cream filling. And I'm like, you cannot bring some home. He goes, I never think about it. Oh you no, know, there's there, there's not a Red Lobster, but there was a Joe's Crab Shack. Yeah, that's so gone. That Remember was that? that? Okay, but that was after. <laughs> Those are overpriced uh, yeah. apartments. I'm just now. trying to, you know, yeah, draw, no. draw a com- yeah. yeah. I said it's the same thing. so specific. I, was, I read it out loud to James. I was like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I was like, there's no red lobster. What did James say? He's lived, he lived in the No, he said no. <laughs> yeah, okay. So one no? person who's lived here a long time said yes, and another person who lives here longer and more Ventura-centric yeah. said no. I'm going to just say it was, you know, artists, uh, yeah. what do you call it? Yeah. Um, like it a license. was licensed. Um, license. Yeah. You know, like license. when somebody's like, I'm from there, and then they ask a fake question Yeah. to be like, <laughs> yeah, maybe there maybe never was a red lobster. Show right now. Like, <laughs> we, maybe we don't know. I'm a longtime resident, but not not a native. Yeah, but this and is a I test. think that's the diff. Yeah, I think that's a test. She's testing us. Yeah. <laughs> but she's Dallas. Not- okay, but <laughs> we're real veterans. <laughs> I got here in 94, so I think I've been here long enough, but I still we never I mean, that well, James point- was born in 88 and lived here this whole life and he well, doesn't yeah. remember one, but he was a wee child for most <laughs> of that time. Yeah. But I know where Red Lobster in Santa Clarita is and we I mean, never there's one in <laughs> We never ate there as a kid. Oh, no, we that's James's favorite restaurant times still. When we lived out there and it was new. And then after, then we had children and couldn't afford to go there anymore. The last time I went anywhere. to the like one that. in Oxnard, it was like very disappointing. Oh, we, yeah. James gets a Red Lobster gift card from a family member for every birthday Aww. and Christmas. So we go at least twice a year. Nice. <laughs> and it is disappointing. <laughs> cheese biscuits Cheese biscuits are never disappointing. Oh, yeah, no. Cheddar Bay biscuits are, are where it's at. But you could make those at exactly. home with the <laughs> box mix. Um so, can you buy the mix at, yes. at, at Red at the Lobster? Grocery? No, it's so, no, at Red Lobster. So you can use the gift certificates for that instead. That would be smart. <laughs> so Katie, you did not. So Anne told what her least favorite was. Yes. What was yours? Um, I think my least favorite was, uh, where did it go? Uh, the one about um, how her parents fell in love. I don't remember which one that was. That was like one, two. How my parents fell in love. That's the Because it was it. so short? No, I was I was just confused by it. Yeah. yeah. Um 
It was like um like shifting offsets, you know. Yeah, is it are they all the same couple? Is it different couples that share similar through lines? Is it like when you tell a story so many times it ends up something different, you know? Maybe it's supposed to be all those things. I Maybe don't know. It's yeah. falling in love over and over again. Maybe. Since love oh. is a choice. Yeah. From different from her perspective, from his perspective, from other people's perspectives. Yeah. Um um I think m- by the time I got to real love, I mean, it started off really interesting. And by the time it got to real love and it's all about the Beatles thing, I think I was inundated by too many sad stories. And by that and the whole thing with the Beatles, that was my least favorite is the, the, oh, the, the midlife crisis. I mean, I love the Beatles, but it was like, oh, the roommates and maybe because sometimes it, in our marriage, it, that was a little too close to home. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um. I wanted to give a special shout out to my favorite part of the book, um, which is an excerpt from, um, hang on, Frozen Windmills, I think. Mm. Um, So it's about... Oh, that one's really good. Yeah. (laughs) So Sandra grows up in, I'm assuming, Ventura, um, and then moves to Indiana. And um, it's about... Hang on, I have to Google something really quick. Um... She mentions, like, the parallels between these two different relationships. Her first love, Stephen, and her current boyfriend or person that she is seeing, Kevin. And one parallel that she draws is between their two different first dates. And her first date with Stephen was at the zoo. And there's a mention of a giraffe with a crooked neck. Yeah. Oh, I thought of you. I know. It made me so happy. Jamina from the Santa Barbara Zoo. She was there when I got proposed to. Aww. Like she was just a special little uh, a little part in my life. It made me really happy when I came to that. I was yep. like, oh my God. Yep. I know her. I love that part. Yeah. Yeah. James worked at the Santa Barbara Zoo for many years. And when he proposed to me, it was on the giraffe deck. And Jamina was there and it made me really happy. Aww. So that was very sweet. I will say she the... lived a pretty long life, didn't she? Yeah, she only no. died recently. Yeah, she died in maybe you know maybe I don't know five years ago. Or something. No, longer yeah. than that. Um, but it was very sweet. Yeah, that made me happy. The ending of that one though has a little bit of a tone to me as like the first one mm. because it's um like you think he's taking her somewhere special. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. But it also feels a little like. A little scary, secluded, <laughs> dark, yeah. scary. So to me, it left like me a little. Like you broke my guitar. Yeah, and this is what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah suddenly because we don't know his character. Yeah, he veered yeah. off the jeep to the right. He and Sandra jostled in their sleeps, uh, in their seats, as it bumped off the highway and onto the frozen dirt of the fields. Kevin steered toward the nearest windmill. Its red light flashed a steady rhythm on and off, on and off, like it was warning her to stay away. Yeah. It's like, ooh. So that's like a spooky. little spooky. Okay, so is it nighttime? How is she going to see the windmill in the dark? Oh, uh, they know. have lights. It's like very spooky. You, yeah. Have you guys ever driven through Animal Valley when the, it's yeah. like, yeah, when through the wind farm there in the night? In Mojave. And we didn't know what it was. It is oh. very spooky yeah. at night because it's just a lot of lights. Yeah. And we had no idea what it was. Yeah. So <laughs> there's this classic story of my childhood um, because most of them are centered around a small town, Mojave, which is like halfway between our house and our like little vacation spot so we would always stop there and it's notoriously extremely windy there and my sister was little we got out of the car and she goes well no wonder it's so windy they have so many fans on the hill <laughs> that's very cute but they do they have a lot of fans on the hill um those um blades are surreal when yeah. they're up close to you <laughs> yeah i've seen them driving down the road mm-hmm. like on a truck yeah they're very big and some of them are bigger than others. Some yes. of them are little. Some of them are giant. Yeah. 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 They're kind of spooky. Yep. Um, would you like to see an expanded version of any of these short stories? Uh, and could any of them be adapted into a full length novel or even a movie? Or which of them do you think could? Because I don't think all of them could or no, need No, some to of be. them are like perfectly short and sweet. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I uh, like some... my, my third place favorite is Sustenance. Like that one's just perfect. Yes. Um. I would like to know more from like it's all receiptless could be interesting. Yeah. And um, I could see real love being sitting. like a cute like um what was that movie where the guy is the only one who remembers all the Beatles oh. songs? Oh yeah. Yesterday that yep. was it. 
But like a cute sort of movie like that, I could see him being in his cover band and like learning to reconnect with his daughter after his divorce. Mm -hmm. And um, I could see that happening. I don't know if I care as much about that one. Yeah. You know, the one I would like to know more i don't know how they would do it but the story to tell around a campfire would be yeah well i feel like it's i don't know how you start do that. <laughs> something good but my only reservation there is that like the not knowing so i guess the yeah. movie would have to keep that the yes movie. yes we're making it a book right yeah or a okay. movie or whatever I, yeah. my first thought is that would be a great movie <laughs> yes yeah yeah, because you don't know. It's like, did they, they said they were both never seen it from again. Did they run away together or did he kill her and run away himself? Or, yeah, it was, uh, I like that one. That would be a fun movie. If, I don't know how you would do that, but some smart person could do that. Yeah. Or book. Um, yeah. So you mentioned sustenance. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that one? Uh, so that is the story of a mother and daughter. Mm-hmm. And um, it starts with, um, the mother saying that, you know, relating that there's, after a daughter leaves, the mother develops a problem with food. There's always too much or not enough, mm-hmm. which is something you commonly hear, you know, empty nesters say. Yes. If they don't know how to How to do cook I cook for, for one. one or two? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I love that as it plays out and you hear about the mom's eating habits at the same age as the daughter, that when she sees that that's the life her daughter leads, mm-hmm. she doesn't force anything on her. She right. just supports her. She she puts in where she can to influence, buys her some apples, and throws out the sour milk. But she's just there to support her and let her daughter now go have yeah. her path, which I think is, as your children age, like letting them go out into the world and like see what they need to do and make their mistakes. Yeah. I, I don't know if it was intentional, but at the end of it, the mother puts apples in the daughter's fridge yeah but it's early on said that she prefers pears to apples oh it's like the daughter doesn't like catch. apples she likes pears and yes. i don't know if that's intentional or not but i thought that that was funny pears like pears. um yeah yeah that one was it was short and sweet um like drawing the parallels between their two lives mm-hmm. when she uh her daughter she's never gonna eat the apples no she's developed the same (laughs) bad eating habits that her mom had when she was her age until she got pregnant and was like oh i need to drink smoothies and eat salads and Mm -hmm. and be better for her daughter Mm -hmm. and then her daughter runs away to college and eats whatever she wants because she's a young a young person yep um do any of these stories remind you of any other books or movies that you have read I've never met an author that takes these small moments mm-hmm. and amplifies them in yeah. this way. Yeah. This, this is very, very refreshing. <laughs> yeah. I really, really enjoyed it. I'm excited to read like one of her full novels because I found that this was very compelling mm-hmm. and I'm interested to see in longer form if it's the same. Cause she also has another short story collection too, that I'm intrigued by, but um, yeah, each I- one of these on its own was like a special little nugget, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> There is uh, a, there are a lot of writers who say that this, um, like this I don't know, genre mm-hmm. of prose, Art form. Yeah. yeah, is is harder than mm. writing long. I form. can imagine it would be because it's so tight. Yeah, you know, just perfectly every word matters and so perfectly developed in each one. And I felt a little bit of like twang of something when i saw that this was the last page i'm like well what's mm-hmm. gonna happen yeah like, like how are you gonna tie it up and you don't in most of these know what happens right yeah. um and i was thinking as i was reading this that this was probably really fun to write yes yes <clears throat> um but you're right i don't know of any others that this reminded me of because number one i don't read a lot of of short form fiction but yeah it was i don't know i just thought it was really well done um so my last question is what of these stories or do these stories have an overriding theme or what what's sort of the through line? What's the what's the theme of this book? Hmm. <clears throat> do you think there is one? Do you think it's just a compilation? Well, no, there's it's definitely like endings and beginnings again and again. Yeah. So whether it's the how end. does the world end? Is it climate yeah. change? Yeah. Is it the end of a relationship? Is it a death? Is it something you broke? You know, mm-hmm. Yeah. End of an era, like for sustenance. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. The back of the book says how to make paper when the world is ending features literal ghosts, spiritual ghosts, charming ghosts, 
ghosts that are dead ends and ghosts that are still living, ghosts of what might yet be and the ghosts of what might have been. Um, how is each of us shaped by what haunts us? So I think when you mentioned before about grief, like that is a through line in a lot of these, not all of them, but um, how to make paper about her family and her hometown. Um, yeah, receiptless, you know, he's he's grieving his lost love. Um, I, we haven't talked about dog sitting, I love dog but sitting. I thought that one was so beautiful, too. That yeah. was so perfect because at first you're like, oh, skeezy friend. Yeah. Right. But then you get to know him. Mm hmm. And he's so he's sweet. He's great with yeah. older people. And, and he yeah. really cares. Yeah. Yeah. And and I have to pull up that uh, part so I can read what it says. Because it was... Um, hang on one second. No, Matt. Frozen windmills. I'm going to keep flipping. Okay. Yeah. Um. So he's talking about, like, the things that remind him of like his grandmother and the girl reminds him of uh, like, who is he reminded of? What is this reminding him of? Um, she slides the glass toward her on the table and places her lips on the thick pink straw and pulls away. I'm the wicked witch. She says, grinning. <laughs> and there's a spark of something in her eyes, a bit of Raina of the toffee haired girl of my grandma. as she wraps her lips around the straw and begins to drink. And it's the connection of between all of these different people in his life. Um, at the very end, it says, we crest the dune and gaze out onto the beach, searching for something familiar. So looking for the dog that has run away, but looking for a connection. He's lost his grandmother and then Jewel, the older woman at the um, assisted living where he works and this girl on the beach and his uh, his uh, friend's sister. And um, yeah, it's, I thought that one was really beautiful. I loved mm -hmm. I loved the way that he talked about and to jewel the older woman that yep. he cared for and and how or, and telling us about how he used to care for his grandmother and all that i thought that one was very sweet <clears throat> and again a little haunting because you don't know if the ending <clears throat> is, tr is only is his true imagination. yeah <laughs> yeah because he yeah. says like in that hasn't happened yet though like yeah i'll tell the story about doing this and that but that hasn't happened yet and like yep. does it happen i hope it happens yeah it's kind of like in it It'd be nice if it's in the real world, but it might just be in his fantasy yeah. world. Right. Of, There's a lot of that in this book. And it may yeah. just be he he's going through a grieving process and this is how he works through his grief. I mean, yeah. he's losing other things, but he has this hopeful nature. And I hope he really was working with older people how, you know, he didn't choose at first to to take care of his grandma. It sort yeah. of became his thing. And it was such an important part of his life that with her gone, he needed someone else to care for. Right. Yeah, there are very literally stories in this book about grief. There's um, the one about making lasagna, lasagna at three weeks after your best friend's funeral. I kind of want to make that recipe. <laughs> I yeah, know. I was thinking good, the same actually, thing. Yeah. You know what? Next um, book club, let's, let's bring one of us. Will bring, make, I'll make lasagna. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about making it first night. <laughs> um, there's the man who lives in my shower. It's obviously, you know, a story of grief. Pieces also. Um, the young woman who realizes after the fact that she was in love with her roommate after he's already died. Um, yeah, so some of them are much more on the nose than, than others. But I would think that that's probably um, an overriding theme, right? I didn't at first figure <clears throat> out that the man in my shower... Well, some of the stories I couldn't tell if the, what the gender was of the main character and after a while I didn't care because it didn't really matter but yeah. the man in my sh at my shower I at first I thought okay this person's grieving are they seeing themselves in a different light that they only like maybe in grief they don't is the only time they see when they're in the showers like might be the only time they actually see themselves they don't look in the mirror or whatever mm. like that and they see a different person than how they feel inside and then i figured out it was a grieving thing right yeah. what was it what was the tie what was on the tie there was something on the goldfish goldfish, goldfish. yeah yeah that one was hard to read yeah. um so those are basic i i don't have a ton of questions for this book because most of our standard book club questions don't necessarily apply to a short story mm -hmm. collection no. but i wanted to go over a couple more that we haven't really touched on yet and just give a little a little you know bit to each one um goose pimples about the um the high school student and the coach 
Um, that one was very interesting because I was totally picturing him at Kimball Park. Mm. Um, yeah. Why, yeah. Like where tons of soccer practices are. Yeah. A huge, huge desolate parking. Yep. Um, it's infinite exactly parking. Mine at yeah. night with just a single you know street light on mm-hmm. yeah. and all it took was her accusation to pretty much ruin his life i was glad that it wasn't that nothing happened you know yeah. that, that that he, he acted responsibly a, icky, like did you get yeah. the, res- the the feeling that part of him desired to respond sure of course because like emotions don't have uh, morality yeah but your reactions to them are where the morality mm-hmm. lays so his yeah. reaction shows him to be a moral character, but like carnal lust is right. That's just a, an and emotion, you, and you get that he obviously felt that way because at the beginning of the story, he's staring at a woman who's stretching in front of his car, <laughs> and he's like, "I yeah, I'm gonna look at her because she's standing right in front of me." But it's it's obvious that this woman is of an appropriate age. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that one was I, I liked that one. It was. I'm glad it didn't go in the direction that I, I was fearing that it would go. Yep. Um, what else? Let's see. Uh, we talked about that. We haven't talked about Tarzan. Um, Tarzan was a little confusing to me. Yeah. So Jeremy, as a, a young kid, gets in trouble at school because he takes all his clothes off and runs around and pretends <laughs> to be Tarzan. And he says he wants to be Tarzan. And his dad says, sometimes you can't be what you want. And... Later, it's revealed that his dad and his mom are divorced after his father came out as gay. It's not explicitly said, but oh, yeah. um, that's what's going on. Um, and it, yeah, it is a little confusing because you don't exactly know what's going on with like, Jeremy. Well, why he won't? Why, why will these he speak? things have manifested as his choice to be silent? Right, because it's not that he can't speak, it's that he chooses not to, as far as we know, because we don't hear from him. Mm-hmm. We're getting the perspective from his mother. She goes to, you know, his English teacher and says, does he speak at school? And she's like, yeah, I think. That teacher doesn't even know. And yeah. But, but she there's, says, but there's 40 kids so in my school. Students. Yeah, there's so many students who probably she's, get through that way. Yeah, I she teach really... eight classes a day, and there's 40 kids in each class, so I don't know. And the ones that she really knows are the ones that she they get in trouble or yeah. are behind it. <clears throat> and so since he's not one of those, he must be okay. Yeah. Do um, you think it's, I thought, yeah, it, it, I definitely thought it was a, a response to trauma. Sure. You know? Yeah. It's interesting that it manifested himself in that way because, and his brother even says like, I don't know why it's going on, but he seems like he's happy. So I think it's fine. But then it made me think about, um, which is the story about the uh, the man who lives in my shower. Is that the one? My yeah. Shower. The man who lives in my shower is that he was severely depressed, but didn't show it. So you can think that a person is completely fine. And on the outside, they seem like they're happy, but you don't know what's going on on the inside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Jeremy can seem like he's fine. He doesn't talk, but everybody's telling his mom, I think he's okay. Yeah. But his mom knows that, he's not you yep. know the other thing that i think oh go ahead karen <clears throat> between him and his brother i there's like a big age gap too is are they from the I same don't think so it yeah. seemed like it because his brother was back i mean how old is is jeremy when he's taking his clothes off in, and oh this is does two different flashback. time frames oh that's so jeremy's a, flash- a little kid but yeah. he's like 17 or 18 he's like yeah. in high school yep maybe 16 okay. 17 i think yeah because i kept thinking that I was confusing the ages yeah. and thinking that there was a big age gap because the way his big brother, when he comes home, is talking to him is almost like a big brother to a significantly younger brother. Yeah, no, I think I think his brother's away at college and he's still in high school. Okay. <clears throat> um, one thing I thought was interesting, which I, again, don't know if it is intentional or not. There are two stories with a character named Jeremy in them. And there's also two too. stories with a character named... Um, Sarah. So oh, there's also two Robies. Robies. In which ones? Uh, one is. I don't. I don't, I don't remember a character. I can read character. a whole book and leave without knowing the name. You know, I could do the, the same character. thing, but today I sat down and I wrote this, and I was yeah. like, I should write down what these characters' names are, yeah. so okay. that I can remember. So Jeremy is the protagonist in Receitless. <clears throat> That's the name of the man. And Jeremy's the big brother. 
Jeremy's the young, the one who won't speak. Oh, okay. So I don't know if it's just, these are a compilation of stories that came and were published in different places. Yeah. So it could just be coincidence that oh, these characters she has have the same name. characters in her head. Yeah. <laughs> and so then, Robbie is in Frozen <clears throat> Windmills and in Pieces. Robbie, I don't remember a character named Robbie and I. Robbie is the one who Robbie's Wick's house, a hazy skied California uh night absent of stars. That was in Frozen Windmills. Okay, and then it talks about I ended up dating one of his friends for a while. This guy named Robbie. Mm. ATN dated him. Dated around two. Most of the girls didn't last very long. So in the world, in the got it pieces. Um, and then there's Sarah is uh, mentioned in. Um, hold on, I have to look for it because I don't remember which ones. The um, Bridget is the girl. No, not that one. It'll it'll take me a second. But uh, the girl at the dog park. He eventually finds out her name is Sarah. Um, who is house sitting or dog sitting? Um, and then the daughter of the um John Lennon uh impersonator in Real Love. Her name is also Sarah. But I think those are two different places because I feel like Real Love takes place in the Midwest. Yeah. Um. But I just thought that was interesting. I don't know if there, you, if you could draw if those are, comparisons. I wonder if these are characters in the off people, names of people in the author's life, and she's portraying different aspects of them. Yeah. Maybe could I be. Um. The other one we haven't talked too much about is Dirt, the last one in the book. Um. About William. Um. And him sort of recalling his his life. His friends, he, you know, he goes off to war. His friends who die at Normandy. Um, he meets another woman in France who asks him to stay with him, with her, and to move to France. And he returns home for his love, Elaine. Um, but at some point during a fight, she says that, you know, he's working too much. He doesn't spend enough time at home. And he says he thinks she should have stayed in France all those years ago. Um, and it's another one of those instances that you don't know exactly what the end of the story is. Yeah. Because she leaves and it's unclear if she actually ever returns or if she's left him. Or if that's the last time he saw her. That whole, I would have kissed her. Yeah. And then it's also unclear what happens at the end. If he gets the help he needs or if he dies. <laughs> um, yeah. Because there's a girl who comes up and says, I have to go drop my dog off at my house. I'll come back and help you. I'm an old man. And he's like in and out, I think, of consciousness for yeah. it. Because he's, you know, sort of. It's like flashback of his own life, you know, like this is your life. Um, yeah, that one made me sad. Uh-huh. I mean, he was a jerk and he should not have said that to his wife, right? Yeah. That was very, that would be very upsetting if somebody said that to you. But when you say something one time, it doesn't speak to your whole character. No, which is why I'm assuming that she probably came back. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine she would leave him for good for that one instance, but it doesn't say that. Mm-hmm. And you also don't know what the time frame is, but I'm assuming that was years ago. Because Elaine is saying, you're never home for the kids. And when he hurts himself and breaks his hip, I'm assuming he's much older. Yep. So I don't know how much yeah. time is in between those two things. Um, yeah. But that was the last one of the of the book. That was the final one. So yeah, 10 interesting stories. 10 very uh, well-written stories. I'm excited to read more by this by this author. Is there anything else? we haven't touched on or anything else you want to say about it anybody it was really good i look forward to reading more from her yeah yeah i totally want to read thanks for ruining my life clarissa the title (laughs) alone has me yeah yeah i like that one um okay cool well thank you to um dallas because she reached out to us on instagram she sent us a couple little goodies bookmarks and some signed um stuff from her uh that we got in the mail and um she also mentioned her first book that she wrote which is called the best week that never happened um i have also have not read that one but um yeah i'm excited to read more from her so thank you to dallas for reaching out to us Mm -hmm. um we enjoyed your book um so who else has been reading this month anybody read anything good i haven't Um. read anything else (laughs) I realized this week that I had to finish this book because I was sort of like taking it easy, like one story at a time. Yeah. Then I kind of had to speed run through a bunch of them. So I spent my morning remembering which ones right. that I had uh, had uh, sped through. So. It's a little bit like junk food where you could eat it real fast. Yeah. And yet then like rich chocolate cake where you're like, oh, 
One's good for today. But I also know myself that if I had read this right when I first bought the book, I would never remember it. You know, three weeks later when we come here to sit down and record, I'd be like, I don't remember any of these. So I saved it mostly for this last couple weeks. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, Well, I went through my audiobooks um, to find stuff that I I downloaded and never read. Mm. And I realized I had Foundation by Isaac Asimov. Um. And I, it, when I first started reading it before, I think I started it, but I was like not in a place where it, it starts, starts with this bureaucracy in space. And that doesn't sound very interesting. And so you get farther into all the yeah the evil pinnings of it. Um, I've been reading Our Separate Ways with a new preface and epilogue. And it's about um, the differences between black women and white women in a work environment. Mm. And how things are different for each set and so that's it's not a fiction it's non-fiction and that's been really good and i started i started reading um the fifth season all over again because there's a an rpg broken earth rpg that's coming out in if later this year um and based on the nk jemison uh broken earth trilogy so uh, it's kind of like a futuristic dystopian D D. cool <laughs> so i want i thought well D D seems beyond me but if i did a, this rpg based on a, a a lore that i already know then i'll be ready <laughs> yeah cool well i really enjoyed um a new book by lee bardugo came out in january called hellbent and it's separate from her grisha book first books Mm. so i re-listened to the ninth or i'm sorry ninth house which is about the secret societies of yale Mm. and um the ninth house which like babysits them all and then the follow-up book is called hellbent and i so i've listened to ninth house three times wow (laughs) because when i finished it the first time i like started right over again because it was so good um and then and unlike the grisha virtue which is very developed when i came to it Uh um which is shadow and bone, I guess is what I'm talking about. Um, this is, she's just started. So there was a wait. Mm. <laughs> um, and I, I want to buy the physical book cause I listened to the audio book of Hellbank. I could read it again. Yeah. Um, really, really rich storytelling and to listen to her interview at the end of ninth house. She, um, speaks to the idea that this was actually one of her early novel ideas, but they couldn't find like a place for it because it wasn't really young adult, mm. which I think might be why at 41 years old, this appeals to me more than the Grisha Burst does, which that is makes sense. really about like older teens and 20 something. Yeah. Fighting the world. Can't really relate. <laughs> well, I mean, you can because we were all there, but this felt just a little bit more because it's only characters maybe a few years older, mm. but it just felt better. Yeah. <laughs> That makes so I sense. really, really enjoyed this. I do enjoy a, like a young adult novel, but sometimes I do feel weird that I'm like, this isn't for me yeah, necessarily, but necessarily. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, exactly. I, a well-written YA is good for everyone, yes. I think, because yes, it's, it's, it's telling stories that we can all relate to, whether yes, you're or living it from. now yeah. or retrospectively, or you're getting something from it if, yeah. if it's well done. Yeah. I thought of another book. Oh, yeah. The kimchi cookbook. <laughs> I know because not all books have to no. be novels. Yeah. And I've made like three recipes and I have planned for a fourth one because there's like, there's more than a hundred different types of kimchi. They're not all super spicy. Mm-hmm. Um, my next one is going to ma- be, uh, help me pronounce this, Cipollini. I have no idea. Cipollini. It's those little really teeny uh, specialized sweet onions. And I've never know. heard of them. It's a ch- cipollini okay. kimchi that you that add delicious. to roasted Brussels sprouts. <clears throat> yum, yum. So Cool. Well, who gets to pick our next book? It's me. Drum it's roll. Me. It's Anne. What are we reading? Uh, Olive E. Blake. Olive alone e. Blake. With, uh, alone with you in the ether. And uh, her name is Olive E, not Olive E. Oh, I <laughs> thought you were saying Olive E. Blake. Yeah. Got it. Olive okay. How do you spell that? O L I V I E. Got it. Blake. Um, she is the author of the best selling book, Atlas Six, which I think also has a mm. follow up book. And I keep seeing 
it being widely read and I'm curious about it. So uh, with this being my turn to choose, I thought, well, here's this like nice smallish novel to see if I'm interested in her writing style. Um, True love is just a matter of time. Alone with you in the ether is a contemporary love story like no other exploring the nature of love, what it means to be unwell and how to face the fractures of ourselves and still love as if we're not broken. Mm. So that is the brief story. Um, that's all I'm going to tell you. Okay. It's a reasonable size audiobook. I think it's nine ish hours. Nice. And it's a nice love short little booky book. 275, it looks like. Okay. No, I'm sorry. 279. <laughs> all right, then. Alone with you in the ether by Olive Blake. Yep. I don't know if that's how you say it, but. Okay, well, cool. Um, thank you guys for listening. Um, make sure to check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash strings unraveled. If you like the podcast and want to um, get a little bit more from us, um, we would appreciate it. And make sure you listen to our normal podcast episode comes out first Tuesday of the month. Um, and we will see you guys in the next one. Bye, everyone. Bye. Strings Unraveled is a production of Strings and Things Studio with Anne Leckervin Cazzoli, Katie Von Rader Fraker, and Karen Wilmoth. Recorded and edited by Katie Von Rader Fraker. Find us online at stringsandthingsstudio.com or on Facebook or Instagram at stringsandthingsstudio. You can email us at stringsandthingsinfo at gmail.com. 